All right. First of all, thank you guys for speaking with me. Thank Appreciate you. it. Um, I want to talk about Burt Wonderstone for a second to start off. Uh, I have a very good family friend who's a professional magician, and magic has been kind of a big part of my life for uh, like since a very young age. Did either one of you have a personal connection with magic at all? How did Burt Wonderstone come yeah, about? We both kind of do. We both were magic geeks as kids. I mean, I think every boy kind of goes through their magic period for you know lesser or more time, but. Um, we both kind of had those magic kits. I mean, John had one. It was Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson, uh, who was a Vegas magician uh, big in the 70s. And uh, I, part of the inspiration for Bert's uh, childhood version of himself finding magic and discovering it was uh, I found a magic kit that had a VHS tape that I would play over and over again to... Uh, perfect the very simple tricks that were on it um and that was kind of how Bert learned how to you know do magic at first as well cool um so how sick of seeing live magic performances are you guys at this we, point oh my god we, you know we spent we spent two separate trips research trips to vegas which always sounds like a funny thing we're doing a research trip to right. vegas but it actually was the first trip we saw like five magic shows in a day and a half wow at one point we found ourselves in the producer literally running down the strip to catch some big cat magician like and you know all the distances in the strip are ridiculously mm -hmm. far it's like a hundred degrees yeah. <laughs> and literally running full sprint <laughs> um, you have to kind of question like if it's, it's worth it right <laughs> but that said you know the magicians we spoke with were hugely like generous with their time and really helpful and like David Copperfield is a big part of this movie and, and Chris Angel and Pendulette and all these guys like were really willing and happy to talk about their world and we couldn't have written the movie the way we did without knowing all that stuff um did you guys have anybody in mind to play these particular characters when you were writing it or no how i think it? you know you set yourself up for dif disappointment if you if you have like a big star in mind when mm -hmm. you, when you're writing it but uh when we did find out who was interested in, in playing these roles we were shocked it was kind of like when when we wrote horrible bosses and they started acquiring this insane cast like we couldn't believe it yeah. yeah i remember getting a call uh from one of the producers on that one saying like it looks like we've got kevin space and jennifer aniston and colin farrell uh and jamie fox i'm like that is a joke call you yeah know, like, it's, so, <laughs> it's so weird it was carrie and corral we we're like okay that'll work you know yeah. like it's a great pairing i mean i think it's some of the best work that these guys have done in a while it's really the, the jim carrey part is so um it's such a fun physical kind of different role for mm -hmm. him and, um, so when you guys are, when you know you're writing a PG-13 comedy like Burt Wonderstone as opposed to an R-rated thing like Horrible Bosses, does that change your process at all? Do you have to like dull down your hu your humor? Is that kind just of a... take out all the genital references and, you know, usually we just start from like a list of genitals and then we just put them in. And we, we, yeah, it's, it's about a 60 page script of all genital jokes <laughs> and then we add the additional 30 pages of whatever Story. hearts, <laughs> you know, babbling. BS. So, um, no, I mean, I think, you know... It is a softer kind of uh, world and tone uh, when you're dealing with Vegas magicians as opposed to three guys who want to kill their boss. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that difficult to keep it, you know, in yeah, that, it wasn't about in that toning, level. It wasn't about toning down because we didn't start from a place of, like, this is going to be so raunchy and mm -hmm. dirty because it doesn't have to be. The, right. the humor in this world is in that PG-13 zone. Kind okay. Of. Um Let's see, what kind of, uh, I know you guys are going to be making your directorial debut on the Vacation uh, reboot starring Ed Helms coming up. Did you find that to be uh, more daunting, more comforting, knowing that you guys are going to be directing your own script or and you know not having to pass that off to somebody who, else who might not we exactly know share? No, we started writing it. We, okay. we, we wrote it for New Line, and then months later we were told they were willing to entertain the idea of us directing, so we had to go in and pitch that. Um, but it's certainly daunting. I mean, it's daunting because it's this beloved franchise. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to mess it up. But it's look, we, we know that there are going to be people that hate us either way for for even for touching it, touching right. it. But uh, we're not trying to reinvent it or or even certainly not remake it, remake it at all. It's it's kind of a continuation of the story of the Griswolds. Mm -hmm. Rusty grown up now, and so I hope that you know any rational mind can appreciate that <laughs> and uh, uh, that we're really just nodding, you know, we're nodding to, at the uh, original which I grew up with, he grew up with we loved, this is one, one of our favorite comedies mm -hmm. and 
you know, building off of that. But it, you know, it is, it's nice that, um, after having a couple movies made that we get to sort of literally call the shots on this one. Yeah. We've been very happy with the way the two movies have turned out that we wrote, but until you actually get in there and direct your script, it's not entirely yours. Mm. So. Well, what, what are the, some of the challenges of bringing a new vacation story to modern audiences? Because, I mean, the, the original is great, but a lot of it's kind of dated now, and most of it relies so much on Chevy Chase's timing and yeah. stuff yeah. like that. We, our starting point was a great family road trip movie and a movie about a father and his sons and a movie about a man and his wife and, and all the mishaps that befall them are all sort of hung on to the skeleton of the story we're telling about these people and that's that's what we try to make as real and as yeah. relatable as it can part, be. Part of uh, going off of what you said with uh, Chevy, you know, he, he really was a contributing factor of how beloved that franchise was. Mm-hmm you could relate to him as though he were your own dad like my dad my dad even looked a lot like him back back in the day and so um just his whole mannerisms were were so great and specific and what we love about ed is that he's got his whole his whole thing to bring to the table and um he's such a likable guy yeah. and and he's a young father and so i think that people will be able to relate to that and, and the fact that um, he uh, he can do no wrong, really, mm-hmm. in the eyes of the public. <laughs> um, have you guys spoken with Chevy and, and Beverly D'Angelo about maybe appearing? Yeah, we, I mean, we're, we're yeah, sort yeah. of in the process of that now. We okay. want to sort of get things a little more hammered out, um, but, yeah, it's our hope that, that they'll be involved. What's the timetable look like for shooting and stuff like we're that? We're shooting starting, mid-June. Yeah. Okay, and, yeah. nice. Um, so, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs is another one of the movies, that, the sequel that, that you guys are tackling, and that the first one's one of my favorite animated movies of the past like, like 10 was. years or something. Really, really great. What is it like stepping into that kind of pre-existing world and taking right. on something like that? Well, that was it's, part of the reason that we wanted to do it, is that we loved it so much. Yeah. And, and there's also, there's a kind of a, um, what's the word, like a, a but there's something about the, the writing in the first one, the tone of it that was a little um, Ad- adult. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess it wasn't your typical animated mm-hmm. movie. There were and references that like were kind of dark and not necessarily kid appropriate, mm-hmm. but done in a clever, you know, PG way that you could get away with it. And we really liked that. It it really does appeal to both mm-hmm. adults and kids, and that's what we tried to do with the second one and the, also the, the the premise of the second one where it's like Jurassic Park they go back to the island and it's these sentient uh, food creatures yeah. was really you know a the fun idea for us yeah, yeah. there are sequels that you, you watch them and you wonder why the hell it mm-hmm. was made and the answer is money you know to, yeah. to make money but this this actually feels like a good continuation of the, the story in the first one that's cool um I know there are a lot of pun-related creatures in that project. The, <laughs> Indeed, there are. The tocodiles and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Did you guys have any of those that you created that you had to end up leaving on the cutting room floor? We had a lot of those. I think we came up with a long list. Um, what were some of them? Well, there are the shrimpanzees. And that's in there. I don't know um, if there was anything that... Yeah, we had well, mosquitoes. That's in there. Um, <laughs> I think that was ours. They had been, yeah. Um, yeah, they had because we, we you go into those meetings and they've already done a ton of art. The walls oh, and the cool. columns were covered in rendering. Yeah, don't worry, been so developed a lot of for stuff literally was, years before okay. we joined yeah. the project. But we did pitch. Yeah, there's I don't even this. remember. We talked about the tomato. <laughs> they encounter that they're going down the river and they see there's a tomato on the side. Like, What's that? Like, it's just a tomato. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you guys have any updates on Horrible Bosses 2? I'd heard rumors that maybe the original guys were kind of com- you know, thinking about coming back for a sequel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we wrote, we wrote, the wrote script. a couple drafts of the, of the, of the script for the sequel. Um, I think right now it's just in a weird stage of negotiations, trying to get um, all the actors back, or mm-hmm. at least the three guys. For some reason, people, if they're in a hit movie, they want more money than right. the sequel. I don't, I don't know <laughs> Um, but we'll see. I mean, I think that, you know, the success of the first one was definitely what sort of led yeah, to this. For um, sure. We'll see if it all plays out. Um, who are the comedy writers working today that you guys are kind of keeping an eye on? Do you have anybody from the past or the present that you're looking to for inspiration or anything? I mean, Albert Brooks, for me, was, you know, a completely different style of comedy than what we've so far, so far written. Mm-hmm. But uh, I've always been a huge fan of his, and obviously Judd Apatow, uh, having come from that camp, mm-hmm. um, 
it was amazing to see like how he had evolved and, and went from doing TV where nobody cared to even keep his shows on the air yeah. to being like one of the kings of comedy now mm. and features. Um, and uh, who else? Um, only Island guys do a lot of funny stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, MacGy or MacGruber, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that he didn't do very well in, yeah. in theaters, it, I'm a huge fan of yeah. because you know it's it's just so nice to see one of those spoof movies that are completely goofy, don't take itself seriously at all, come out because people are afraid to do that and. Um, I That's hope kind that of with forty thousand dollar man that we wrote is, is in mm -hmm. that vein yeah. a little bit. It's sort of the, the spoof movie. Uh, I was wondering about like Jim Rash and, and Matt Fax and those guys mm -hmm. going from a screenwriting duo to a, a directing duo. Have you guys had a chance to see The Way Way Back? No, they're, they're directing. I no, saw no, it at yeah. Sundance. It's really great stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I just didn't know if you guys had like hung out with I them. Haven't yet. No, I mean mm -hmm. we did. We met with uh, Chris uh, uh, Miller and Phil Lord, um, partly because of you know the cloudy connection, mm -hmm. but also just to ask them about co-directing and we're and sort of doing the rounds and, and grilling all the directors who we can cool Judd Apatow and, and um, a bunch of other guys just sort of Ivan Reitman trying to yeah oh, trying nice. to glean from them mm -hmm. everything we can um, let's see could you guys talk about your writing process and how you guys specifically work together because I know a lot of people like you know take a document and kind of share it back and forth somebody yeah. takes a run at it we how do you guys almost work? always work in the same room together or at least on on line sharing the screens we're looking at the same page okay. um, we rarely like go off and do separate scenes and then bring them together I think the luxury of having a writing partner is being able to play jokes off of each other and see if it works mm -hmm. yeah. I mean it would be probably easier in some respects if it would be half the time I guess we could just break it up down yeah. the middle and do it that way but we always seem to, uh, to actually be together nice um, so, John, I have a question for you. With the resurgence of Star Wars now that Disney's announced more films and stuff, have you heard any updates about the 525, uh, 77 <laughs> yeah. getting released? No, I mean, I know that... the vault. For that <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bring it I back. know that Patrick Reed Johnson, the director, uh, just screened it at Toronto okay. uh, Film Festival. I think it was still unfinished when he screened it. Okay. But, yeah, uh, last I heard, he was like touring it around the country and stuff, and yeah, making like a mini documentary there's, there's about a, that. There's a mini documentary called Hearts of Dorkness <laughs> that follows him trying to get the remaining funding that he needs to finish it. I don't, I don't know I the anything. latest about it. Okay. I mean, I wish him the best because it's a project that he's worked on for many years and yeah. is true to his heart as it's autobiographical. Yeah, a lot of people on the on our site on first showing like really dug the trailer when we posted it years yeah. ago and stuff and people yeah, keep asking like what the deal is. So Yeah, it's and, it's it's definitely unfinished still, so I I don't know how much work it needs, but mm -hmm. Um, you guys mentioned earlier like the the stuff that you've worked on thus far. Do you have any aspirations to do anything other than comedy or many any other directorial projects that you're looking yeah, at I mean, in the I future? Think, I think we talk about we'd love to one thing we try and do is to not do any one thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why we've tried to do both our hard art comedy and PG animation because it's just it keeps it more interesting. It's more of a challenge to do different things. And also, the more things you have going, the more hopefully get on screen. Mm -hmm. You know, because most movies don't go. That's, that's the reality. Yeah, we have like ten so. projects in development yeah. that have never made it. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, we definitely, I think, would like to sort of make our way toward somewhat more grounded, somewhat more um, real human sort of movies, probably smaller scale, mm -hmm. um, and maybe write and, hopefully write and direct those. Um, Something produced independently, maybe, and there's also TV that we, we, we have a, an idea that we've been working on with, a, with an actor um, that uh, we would hope to pitch and, and sell. Stay as vague as possible. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> a meeting with an actor. Yeah. Cool. Create a thing. For a TV network. <laughs> well, you mentioned you know, kind of doing different things. How how did the script for Horrible Bosses two go as far as like not just being a cop, a direct copy of the first one? Because like the Hangover it was important two, to us to yeah. to not just replicate yeah. the same movie. To to do a thing where like we're trying to kill three more bosses just to embarrass it. You know? Right? Like, who the hell would do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that may actually I don't know. I mean that if it stays that way, that may frustrate some fans who just want to see the same thing again mm -hmm. or want to see you know the same actors do the same thing. But um, it was fun and in some ways easy to write because the voices of those characters were so clear in our heads. Yeah, it's always yeah. it's like being on a TV show where you know the characters and so yeah, and it's fun to nod toward like sequences that happened in the first one, but not necessarily rely on the same 
dynamic and, and, and the jokes that you know yeah. worked in the first one. We don't we don't really know how it's all going to turn out, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we were we were pretty happy with the uh, with the direction that we we took it in. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we were happy with what we wrote. <laughs> All right, really good to hear. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate your time. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you.